Hey everybody, Zachary Jeans. Let's keep walking through the Bible. So today is day 223. Is that right? Yeah, day 223. Welcome back. Let's keep walking through this. So um, we're in uh, Ephesians chapter 4. And uh, I think we're going to just go through the rest of this chapter today. Um, we're going to talk about the new life we have. The new life that we have in Christ. And uh, yeah. And yesterday we, we talked a lot about the nuances of relating to one another. How to view people who are in other denominations and give room for the fact that even though they may broadly teach things that don't lead to salvation, that there are those within that uh, group that may in fact have salvation. And, um, and just to just have a gentleness and an open mindedness to others. And also realize, you know, that that passage isn't even talking about denominations that we understand today. Uh, it's talking about this mystery and unity of the Jewish people and the Gentiles. That hostility, that difference, that, that uh, separation has been obliterated by the love of Christ, by his blood, and by the faith that we can have in him together. His Holy Spirit, which can live and dwell in all people who have faith. And uh, we're one body. We're one body. So um, when we do relate to one another and we do teach or help or shepherd or um, open up new territory for God around the world, spread his message, care for others, we do so speaking the truth in love. We don't do do it through acts of, you know, scheming and cunning and divisiveness. That's not the earmarks of God's spirit. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, saw that we got a, another subscriber or two over there on YouTube. I appreciate you um, very much. Uh, thank you so much for the sharing. I, I see a... I see uh, my aunt, uh, Jocelyn, always faithful to share for me on her Facebook page. Um, and I'm sure I step on the toes of people who are like, who is this guy? And and some people are blessed, but I'm sure I step on toes and, and I apologize. Um, I'm, my, my, my goal isn't to create division, um, but like I know not everybody jives with what I'm teaching. I would not have jived with what I'm teaching when I was 21, 22 years old, okay? Like, I would have had disagreements with me. Um, so I get it, I totally do. Um, but I do appreciate if one of these sermons or the sermons in general, these episodes resonate with you and you feel like uh, they might resonate with other people, I do appreciate it when you share it out. And uh, you know, another good way, uh, which, can be low key and helpful to share is just, you can send it through a text message, especially from the YouTube channel, right? And uh, and add your own two, two cents to it. Just like, hey, uh, I think this guy's all right. I don't agree with him 100%, but this sermon, he talks about this and this, and I just thought you would wanna hear it. That's always a helpful way too. So you, when you share, you don't have to agree with everything I teach. Without uh, a doubt, you don't. So anyway, a little bit of coffee here. Got my Rip City going today. Um, the NBA schedule came out. Um, our team is going through a lot of transition. <laughs> so I, I'm hoping it all works out. I, I think in general, regardless, it's going to be a rough season as far as wins and losses go. Um, but I don't always watch games to see who wins. Um, 
if it's a real heavy losing season, uh, there's ways in which you can watch if you're like emotionally attached to something. Uh, you can watch till they're ahead in the fourth quarter and you know that they end up losing the game, right? But you could just watch until they're ahead in the fourth quarter and then turn it off. And so you know that they lose, but where you left the game off is where they were winning. Um, sometimes they'll do that with the Blazers, you know. I don't know. Anyway, so that's Rip City, Portland Trail Blazers, for those of you not in the Portland area. All right, so why don't we pray, and then let's pick it up. We're going to be in verse 17 of chapter 4. Lord, I love you. God, thanks. Thanks for things like sports teams and, you know, fall and winter and just different time of year. Uh, I love the summer. I love the I love the warming up of spring and summer and all that, but um, I think fall is my favorite, Lord. Fall is my favorite. Um, please speak to us. We're getting ready to transition into these times, these seasons. And, uh, and I just pray that you'd help us understand you today, Lord. Lord, I just lay this time before you. God, we love you. Please talk to us about our new life with you. Help us see beautiful and wonderful things. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. All right. All right. <clears throat> Let me get another sip of coffee. Okay. Verse 17, chapter 4. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. All right. Well, first of all, Paul is primarily talking to Gentiles who have been saved. So what is going on here? Is he double speaking? No. I think it's fair to assume that he's not like, at one moment, he's talking to Gentiles who have been saved and that they need to stop having enmity in their hearts, hostility with the Jewish people and those that have been saved within the Jewish church, um, Jewish body, right? That they're one body, one spirit. He knows he's talking to the Ephesians, okay? He's talking to people who grew up with pagan ideologies, uh, various forms of worship, he knows that. So what is he saying here? Let's look at it again. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. So now he's drawing a distinction. You're no longer Gentile or Jew, but you're in Christ. You're in his body. He's just spent a lot of time explaining that. So this is the distinction I think he's drawing. And now he's like, He's like, okay, you were, in fact, Gentiles, and you were, in fact, Jews, but now you're one in Christ. I think that's where he's leaning this letter towards. So when he says that, you know, no longer as the Gentiles do, he's like, no longer walk as you are, but as you were, because that's the tone in text, right? They are darkened in their, um, the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds, they're darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God 
because of the ignorance that's in them due to the hardness of heart. There's a lot there about how it works when you don't know the Lord. We have hardness of heart. That means our hearts are not soft. Our hearts are hard. He's going to use the word callous, like the calluses on our hands, right? Um, there is an ignorance in, that's in us because of the hardness of our hearts. There's a darkness, not light. There's ignorance, not understanding. So let's go back through now and read it that way and understand what it is that he's juxtaposing. Now I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. Okay, let's flip that around. Now I say this and testify in the Lord that you must walk and then insert here what you might. Well, let's say new self created in the likeness. Um, you could say one that has a part of, part of uh, the body of Christ because he just got done with that metaphor, that image. But let's just say, now I testify in the Lord that you must walk as those uh, a part of the body of Christ. In the futility of their minds. Well, what's futility? What's the opposite of futility? Well, something that's futile is something that doesn't have uh, any hope of attaining its goal. Futility is something that is without without a full result. It is an empty proposition. So if you read this and you understand what he's saying on the other side of it, that the body, somebody who's a part of Christ, should walk with an achievable hope, a, a fullness of understanding in their mind, not futility, not like an empty proposition, but a full proposition. They're darkened in their understanding. Another way for the other side would be that you would be enlightened in your understanding. Alienated from the life of God, not alienated, at home in the life of God. Are you at home in the life of God? Because of the ignorance that is in them, Instead of being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance in them, it would be at home, a resident of the life of God because of the knowledge that is in you. Due to the hardness of their heart, due to the softness of your heart. So we can have now an understanding what not to be okay but we also get to see kind of on the flip of it if you flip it around and it's not a perfect thing here it's not a perfect science what i'm doing but hopefully it's helpful to stop and realize well wait if he's saying not to be this way what is the what is the opposite of that what is the true like flip of that because that the other side of it is how you ought to be. And if you understand how you ought to be, you can also get a sense of with what not to be a fuller understanding of, of who you are in Christ, right? So now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must walk as the believing church does in the hopefulness of your mind. 
that you be enlightened in your understanding, that you be a resident in the life of God because of the understanding that's in you due to the softness of your heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy practice of every kind of impurity. They have become callous. What's the opposite of callousness? Well, we just talked about softness, suppleness. Uh, the idea of a callus is that it doesn't feel, that it's a protective layer of skin, hard skin. Calluses are good in one sense, right, when you're working. But that's not what he's using this here, right? Callousness is a unwillingness to feel. Um, an inability to feel. So... They have become callous. You have become feeling empathetic, maybe, and have given yourself up to sensuality. No, to a life of sexual purity, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. How about steadfast to practice every form of purity? It's just the straight across. Okay, so you have become feeling empathetic. And have given yourself up to a sexual purity. And you are steadfast to practice every kind of purity for that matter. So I know this is really clunky to go through with me verbally. But a good way to do it is to actually write it out by hand and just to think through the definitions of the words and realize, well, what would be the opposite there? What would be an effective flip of each phrase? What is Paul saying on the other side of his statement? Okay, but let's go back through. So now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them due to their hardness of heart. They become callous, giving themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. That is not the way you learn Christ. That's not the way you learn Christ. So if you see that sort of behavior in you, uh, that's not how you should be operating now that you know the Lord. Okay. This is where people can get a little too fine tuned too. Too, too. <laughs> Take a phrase like callousness, right? They become callous. So then you're sitting there in the pew and you know, you're going to really have communion and they read the passage and, you know, let everybody examine his own heart before he takes, you know, the sacrament, right? So you're sitting there examining, Lord, I know the pastor is just talking about us becoming callous out of Ephesians and Lord, have I become callous? And then you start to look for any possible thing and then you go, well, was I being callous there? I don't know. Well, if I don't know, then I must be. And if I must be, then I must be guilty. If I must be guilty, then, oh, Lord, am I even a believer? Am I even your kid? I must not be. Oh, Lord, I want to put my faith back in you. I'm sorry. And it's like, the Lord's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa. Easy there. I was talking about people when they're unbelievers. And yeah, you don't want to, in general, have this callousness towards my gospel, this unfeeling nature, uh, 
you don't have a life that embodies greedy sensuality, you know, sensuality and greedy for every impurity. Like we're talking about a life that is riddled with, you know, sinful behavior, like absolutely permeated with it. And it doesn't in any way look like somebody who knows me. And you're over there worrying and sweating it out because, you know, when somebody told you about their, um, I don't know, their sick pet, you know, you didn't, you know, break out and, you know, empathetic, heartfelt, you know, tears. And you judge yourself callous. Okay. You don't want to sit there and micromanage your heart that way. Are we all callous to some degree or another? Of course we are. Do we all have impurities and desire things in this world that we ought not desire at times? Yeah, that's temptation and sin. But we have a new nature in ourselves that tells us, us the very fact that you actually care to not do those things anymore, or that you even care to start going, God, am I being callous? Like the very fact that you do that tells you that you've had a change of heart, that God's spirit's living in you. But don't let, don't let a over micromanaging of your senses and sensibilities uh, get you to a place of inaction is my point. If, if you're tearing yourself apart gets you to the point where you can't even talk to people because you're afraid that you're going to somehow be callous, you know? Oh my goodness. Take a deep breath. Go love people the best you can. Okay? All right, now let's listen to Paul. Verse 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry, don't sin. Be angry, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but, leather, but rather let him labor, do an honest work with his own hands, so that he might have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander, let it all be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, tender -hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. That is the end of this whole list of good and bad behaviors, right? As God in Christ forgave you. That's the foundation on which all this conclusive, all this writing concludes into. So do all of this because, hey, you were wrong, but God forgave you. So now you can stop stealing and you can start working and giving because God forgave you. You can forgive others because God forgave you. You were sealed for redemption because God forgave you. You can stop talking smack about other people. You can stop corrupting other people. You can stop scheming and all this stuff because that's wrong, but God forgave you. So now you're free to do the right thing. You can build other people up. Now, I want to talk about, and this is probably what I'll kind of conclude on with our last little section here. I think this is so important. This is so much wisdom, and it builds on the whole speaking the truth in love, you know, from yesterday. Okay. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Only such is as is good for building up as fits the occasion 
that it may give grace to those who hear. Okay, let's see what he's trying to say. It should be obvious. But this is one of those things which Paul is saying overlays. It's one of these things, though it's only a sentence, should overlay and permeate every aspect of our lives. There are certain truths which are core to our everyday moment by moment lives. This is one of them. This is how in which we relate to one another. This is how we relate to those who don't know the Lord, to those who do know the Lord, to those at our work, those at our home. It's every occasion. Okay? So, so first and foremost, corrupting talk. Whole sermons can be taught on that. We're not going to. What is corrupting talk? Stuff that disrupts and destroys. Stuff that sows seeds of discord, schemes, greed, all kinds of things. Basically, anything that takes and steals to build up self. Okay? There's a whole sermon in that. I think we all get it. There are nuances, and we've talked about them in other, other other episodes. But, like, he just pits this as a context. So, no corrupting talk. Come out of your mouth. What kind of talk should come out of your mouth? Okay, only the kind of talk which is good for building up. So, when we talk to others, we're looking, what is the most loving thing here to do? Does that mean it could be a hard truth? Yeah, it could be a hard truth do so in love we seek to do it so that ultimately the person can be built up right into the body of christ okay as fits the occasion as fits the occasion listen read the room just because you can say something doesn't mean you should say something. Just because you, you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. How do you know? Does this build the situation, the person up? Is it loving to do this? Or is it a corruptive action or word? Does it destroy? Does it tear down? Is it out of a fit of anger? Right? He'll go on to talk about that. As fits the occasion. So let's say you're at a, you're a Christian and you're at a, uh, a Hindu funeral service. Does it befit the occasion for you to interrupt that service, that time that you've been graciously invited to attend by somebody and announce your theological point of view on the situation? No, it clearly does not. Does that build up or in any way do well by the gospel or Jesus? No. In fact, you really don't see Jesus going and flipping tables everywhere he goes. He did that once for a point in the temple, and he did it in anger at the injustice that was being performed upon especially the poor that were coming for sacrifice to offer sacrifice in place of their sins to honor God. And you had people taking advantage of them. One time he flipped those tables. Okay. That wasn't his daily. So as fits the occasion. Are you in a situation at work on a Zoom meeting 
or in a conference room? And does it fit the occasion to question a broader company decision and pattern in that room? Well, you go, no, that's not the place for this. Then why would you do that at church? Does it, does it make sense to go up to somebody at the prayer time at the end of church and instead of receiving prayer, tell them everything that you think is wrong with that sermon that they just heard with you? No. As fits the occasion. Does that in any way, any, in any way add to? No. No. Does it help you to go up to the pastor afterwards and, and let them know and take up all of their time? Even if you had real disagreements or, or further insights, right? Does it help to take that pastor away after the sermon when they're trying to greet and hug people and, and bless people with just a quick word um, to go soak up all their time? afterwards and make them have the uncomfortable moment to go, hey, um, read the room. I, I care about you, but look, there are other people here who I've got to, this is a brief moment in time when I can just make sure I check in with them all. If you want to talk more, can, can we just talk later in the week? And you're all like, no, I'm going to tell you every single thing. And out of love, that pastor might stand there and listen to you at the exclusion of the entire body. And are you building up the body in that moment? No. It's pretty selfish, actually. And is that pastor actually going to hear anything you're saying? Because you're disregarding? Not only do they probably disagree with you for good reasons doctrinally. You may be right. They may be right. Who knows? But you are ruining the time after church. <laughs> For all the other people, and they just see a person who clearly needs to grow in their own maturity in Christ when they're talking with you because you can't read the room. Read the room. Offer a word as it fits the occasion. Is the right time to share the gospel at the cash register when there's a line behind you? and you're checking groceries out and they're done and they're like handing you a receipt, is that time to invite them to church when they're at work and their manager's standing right over there? There's a line of people at Walmart. Is that, is that a good time? And you're like, Jesus commanded me to share the gospel, blah, blah, blah. And you have all these justifications. Read the room. Does that, does that in any, all they see is like, oh my gosh, that person is nuts. They can't read the room. As fits the occasion. So how do you fit the occasion? Read the room. Listen. Watch. Hear. Get out of your own thoughts for a second and observe. Okay, what's the cadence? How are people talking? What's the interactions like? What level of, of depth can we go in these conversations? that's acceptable in this format. What kinds of subjects are being talked about, okay? Well, I think within this context, when I'm going through the check it out, they can say, thanks, have a great day. And you say, you too, God bless. Grab your bags and out. Maybe that's all you get to do at the checkout counter. At this, at the funeral, at the Hindu funeral or whatever that I gave as an example, afterwards, somebody goes, you know, hey, Zach, I, you know, I know you're a Christian. What did you think about all that? Well, I want to be respectful of, of your worldviews. Absolutely. And I know you're grieving for the loss of this person. And I understand how you think about where their spirit went and how they're coming back into life in a different form or whatever, you know, as you go through that with them. And then they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, well, I want to just talk to you. Like, if, you, if you're open to it, just read to you that it, I think. So from my point of view, it's pointed for us to wants to live and wants to die. Right. And then you can kind of go through it and you can read the room on that conversation. But I wouldn't initiate it, not in an event like that. Right. So read the room 
as the situation, the occasion fits, right? Anyway, <sighs> love people, be empathetic, speak truth and love. And until next time, keep walking, all right? God bless you. Bye-bye.